how we are such a family. And New Year's Eve was just, it was so much fun to be together, to, to bring in the new year, and to just to do things I haven't been a part of probably for a long, long, long time, and, and a long, long, long time. But I just, I, I praise God for Christian people and for the way that we can be more than just a people. We can be a family. And I'm, I'm thankful for this church. Praise God. Mm-hmm. Uh, I jumped up in front of me. I didn't see him either. <coughs> you know, my, my, one of my New Year's resolutions is to not have the issues that I have with my electronics every Sunday. So we're going to hope and pray that that doesn't happen this year at all. Uh, one of the biggest stresses that I have is that I try to put so much into making sure that we have things right. And then we get here and things fall apart that I realize, you know, it's not about me. You know that? It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about Him. Amen. And so if we come in here and we focus on Him, it doesn't matter what happens with the electronics. It doesn't matter what happens with the different sounds and if I trip over the cords or not. I know I get set up on that all the time, but I'm still going to try to make it happen so that I don't trip and you guys don't get to laugh at me. <laughs> um, I'm excited because over the holidays, I got to spend some time with my girls. Now, for most of you, you know, because you, you've heard me talk or you were here and you saw and met my son, I got to meet my, I got to, I got to spend some time with my son and my grandkids as well, but while I was spending time with my girls, um, we did like we usually do. We kind of all sit around and we usually get in a, a, in a living room. Uh, I think that's because back when I was younger with my grandparents and Barb's grandparents, we always sat around the kitchen table. <coughs> and I, have, I just despised sitting around the table all the time. So I always make sure we're somewhere a little softer, a little more comfortable. And I try to make sure we're in the living room. But that doesn't always happen. But anyway, we were sitting around the living room. I think we, were, I think we had actually just finished opening some gifts and, and celebrating a little bit of, uh, of Christmas exchange. And Tara said to me, she said, Dad, I have something I'd really like you to preach on. And so we started talking about that because I don't know why. Maybe you guys experience this. But we can have a family gathering. We can have a fun gathering. We can have all these things happening. And ultimately, we always end up talking about spiritual things. I don't know why. Maybe it's because that's who we are. Right? Right? Right. We're spiritual beings. So we always end up talking about spiritual things. And Kara started sharing that she had this thing she wanted me to preach on. Well, I told her, I said, I, I, I'm, I might. Um, I won't tell you no. I'll pray. I'll see if God leads there. But I can tell you that what you're asking me to preach on is really kind of a tough thing for me to put a sermon together. I'm not going to go there today, so I'm not going to tell you all about that. But she asked me something pretty tough to preach on. And then Kristen, actually Mike, you guys all know Mike and Kristen. So Mike actually said, you need to talk to Kristen. She's got a great idea for a great sermon series that I think you would be really good to preach. And so Kristen then started to share. And she shared this idea that I thought was really good. So I said, well, again, I can't promise, but I'll pray. And I'll see what God says. And I felt like God really, I don't know, just kind of said yes. This is where we need to go. This is a good, a good thing. So I'm not trying to give any more credit to Kristen than I am Kara. But at the same time, what she said, what she asked me to preach on, really (laughs) sparked um, something big in me. So let me explain. Let me share with you a little bit about what she said. She said, why doesn't anybody ever preach on Jesus from birth to death between Christmas and Easter? And I said, hmm. That's pretty good. I didn't correct her, and she's probably going to watch this video, so she'll probably call me sometime and say, why did you say that? I didn't correct her, but 
I could never preach on birth to death of Jesus, but I could preach on birth to resurrection Amen. of Jesus. And I know that's really what she was talking about because Easter is resurrection. So in all of that, I thought, you know what? I am going to see if God will let me go there. And so I'm starting to put together a little bit of the beginning of what Jesus and his life looks like and how that fits into our lives. Now, I don't know, um, I don't know if this will work for you, but it seems to me like many of you over the past couple years have come to me and said, what is it that we believe as a church? What do we do with Jesus? as far as Nazarenes are concerned. How does this all fit into us being Christians or us being followers of Christ? If you or somebody you know has been asking those questions, let me say, this would be a really great series for you to bring them to. Because I intend to get really deep and tear this thing apart and figure out what it is Jesus' life as recorded in the scriptures, what this thing says to us and how we can live by what it says. That's really where I'm going. Now, I, I know I go there pretty often and that's kind of where I always preach, but I, I'm going to be focused on birth to resurrection throughout the next few weeks. I want to let you know that there are going to be some times when we deviate from that because um, I know that at some point we're going to have a couple um, uh, visiting preachers and they probably won't preach where I'm going to be at that point. But even if that happens, as that happens, I'll just come back the next week and continue in that series, okay? All right, so with that said, uh, if I can find where I am in my sermon, I'll let you know what we're going to do next. <laughs> All right, so I want to talk a little bit about the genealogy today. And if you get my text, you've probably been the last two days saying, why is he sending that? There's not a whole lot of spiritual in this. What is he trying to get me to read in this? Let me get into it a little bit. We're given the genealogy of Jesus in the first chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. And that's where I'm going to be focusing today. I'm pretty sure that most of you would say, this is not something that you consider exciting to read. Right? I mean, when you read the genealogy, you don't find yourself saying, oh man, this is so good. Man, I, I wish this would go on and on and on for a couple more chapters. <laughs> That's not what you find, right? I mean, it's kind of a repetitive thing. So-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so. I know I'm in, the, I'm in the King James, I'm sorry. It's kind of where I remember. But And then, after that, it says that so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so and so, and so on, and so on. And so on, right? It, get, it just gets, it gets kind of almost, into, I hate to say this about Scripture, but it kind of gets old. You know, okay, so so and so is the dad, of so and so is the dad, of so and so is the dad. Of okay. Yeah, that's really good. I mean, it just doesn't. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be really clean. I'm really clean with you. When I first really started getting into Scripture, and I was reading that. I was like, okay, I'm turning the page. I'm going to go to the next chapter and start because this just isn't getting it for me. So the question becomes, why is this in the Bible? And what's its purpose for me? I want to say this. This is one of the reasons that I enjoy pastoring you guys so much. You guys have such great questions. And you're always asking them. Every time I get up here, it seems like you ask me a question like that one. Why is this in the Bible? 
And what's it got to do with me? Well, let me take some time this morning to investigate why we're given this lineage of we're given this lineage of Jesus. See, the lineage of Jesus' family has to have something to do with what we're doing today, or it wouldn't be in there. I want to start this morning by reading from the scriptures, but I'm going to do this a little bit different today. First of all, you can stay seated while I'm reading from the scripture. And I know that's weird, but you can stay seated while I'm reading from the scriptures today. Second, please open your Bible or your electronic Bible to Matthew chapter 1. Third, I need you to follow me as I jump around a little bit in this chapter. I'm going to give you a couple seconds because I see, see books going. Alright. So it says this. I'm starting in 1, verse 1. Chapter 1, verse 1. The record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham, Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Now jump to, chap- jump to verse 5. Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David the king. David was the father of Solomon by Bathsheba, who had been the wife of Uriah. Now jump down to verse 16. Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. I want to pray for us right there. So just pray with me. Lord, I pray that you would make this really come alive to us today. I pray that you would open our hearts and minds that we would see exactly what you're trying to tell us here today. God, I ask that you would show us what you have for us in this bit of scripture that just doesn't seem to really matter in our lives today. Help us see what it is you have for us. Help us understand better how we can apply it to our lives. And Lord, send us to go and make a difference because of what we learn through these scriptures. Lord, I pray that you would hide me in the shadow of your cross, that everything I say would would bring glory to you and your name, and will give you glory and praise. Amen. Amen. There's a few things I want to point out right away. First of all, the patriarchs were the great-grandchildren of Abraham. The patriarchs were the great-grandchildren of Abraham. This means that Joseph, some of you don't know all the stories of the Bible, and that's okay. I'm going to give you a lot of history today. <clears throat> Joseph, who is the brother of Judah, Judah's mentioned in that, line, in that lineage, Joseph was the great-grandson of Abraham. Joseph is the guy that was sold into slavery by his brothers. Joseph's the guy with the coat of many colors. Joseph's the guy that they made a musical about. Joseph's the guy that has lots and lots and lots of stories told about him. Children hear about Joseph because Joseph was a man of integrity. Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers because he was proud of his connection with God. There's a whole lot more to that story, and you're going to find out throughout this sermon that I'm going to leave a lot of things out. But Joseph (coughs) is part of this lineage of Jesus. And they were two generations, great-grandfather, two generations from the guy who left everything to follow (coughs) an unknown God he didn't know. He just heard him one day. Another sermon. Another story. But Abraham. Abraham heard the voice of God. 
And so he went because he was called to go. Two generations are the patriarchs. They're called the patriarchs because they're the 12 sons of Israel. <laughs> I'm going to get into that a little bit more. Israel's name is also Jacob. Okay? Judah, Joseph, and their brothers would have experienced much of their upbringing under the influence of what Abraham taught. All right, I know we let the kids go, but just go like this. If you've ever sung or caught yourself whistling or anything like that, Father Abraham, go ahead. I know, it's one of those songs my kids did this song over and over and over and I would leave the room. You're like, oh, I'm so tired of that song. But we know who Abraham is. Abraham is the father of our faith. That's what we call him. Because he walked away from a whole community of people that didn't know the one true God. They were called, they were called lots of things, but they were not believers in God. They had God's Okay? Joseph, Judah, and his brothers, the patriarchs, the 12 sons of Israel, would have known, if they didn't know Abraham, they would have at least known Abraham's influence. Because Isaac, Isaac is Abraham's son, he was Joseph's grandfather. Reading through chapters 25 and 30, through 35, of Genesis. You can find that generations overlapped. They overlap just like they do today, right? Some of you know your parents. Some of you know your grandparents. <coughs> Probably some of you know your great grandparents. It happened the same way then, and you can read that if you'd like to in Genesis chapter 25 through 35. So, even though they lived longer, they still were overlapped. It says in there that Abraham lived to be 175 years old. It says that Isaac lived to be 180. It says that when Isaac was about 40, he married Rebecca. It says that when he was about 60, there were two twins born to him, Esau and Jacob. Again, another sermon. I'm not going to go into all that too much today. But I also found that Jacob was about 40 years old when he stole Esau's blessing. And that's when he went out to find a wife for himself. Again, just like today. Parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, they influence the way we live our lives. And these were influenced by Abraham. Remember, we're talking about Jesus' heritage. Jesus' lineage. So this is the lineage of Jesus. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, right? Judah. They're all in there. Next, I think it's worth mentioning that Salmon was the father of Boaz. Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab. <coughs> well, we can read about Rahab. She's found in the book of Joshua, chapter 2, if you'd like to read about Rahab. It seems that Rahab owned a home that was located on the outer wall of a town called Jericho. It made it easier for her to make a living with the profession that she had. See, Rahab was a harlot. Rahab was a prostitute. And it was very well known that when you walked, when you came into a city, that's one of the first places that you could easily get to that would welcome you in. I'd like to try to keep this as rated G as possible, but at that point, it gets a little bit hard. Think about this. Joshua was the leader of the Israelite nation. He had just taken over for Moses. And he felt God saying, 
Go. Cross the Jordan. Go and take the land of Canaan. I've given it to you. But Joshua was a man of military influence. He was one of the generals. He was one of the guys that put things together. So he used his military insight and said, well, let's send a couple guys over to find out what's going on. And so he did. And his two spies go to Jericho because that's the first city that they're going to encounter. And when they get into Jericho, which we're told it's in the evening, they want to find a place to rest, I think. And they find that rest, or whatever they're looking for, in the house of Rahab. Again, I'm keeping this as G as possible. Okay? In Rahab's house. Now, what happens? The king of Jericho hears that there's people from Israel coming to look at their city. They're, he's worried, right? What did, what did the Israelites do when they found a, a place that they were supposed to be? They wiped it out. It's what everybody did in those days. You took over. Rahab gave those spies refuge. She took care of them. She hid them. And she helped them escape. And because of that, the Israelites <coughs> spared her and all that were with her when the walls of Jericho fell. Hmm. Rahab agreed to protect the spies and asked them to protect her. Isn't that kind of how we do things? I mean, think about it. How many times have you done something out of the kindness of your heart not expecting anything back? Not expecting anything. I mean, you know, somebody that maybe has something you want or can help you with something and they come and ask you for help, you don't think for a second about how they might bless you if you help them. See, I think in our human nature, most of us at least consider, well, if I help them, maybe they'll do this for me or maybe they'll do that for me. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that that's how we do everything because I do believe that a lot of us give out of the generosity that we have. Out of our hearts, out of our abilities, a lot of us give out of that. But sometimes there's that thought, maybe they'll do something for me. Or maybe if I just do, somebody will do for me later. Pay it forward. You've all heard that, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So it's not really that out of character for someone to ask for a blessing from somebody that they're blessing. Okay, so the spies, they agree, and Rahab and her family are spared. Then, evidently, Salmon sees something in Rahab that he likes, and he married her. Makes her his wife. And they're blessed with a son named Boaz. Why is that important? It's important because in the next story, Boaz is the main character. It's the book of Ruth. And Ruth is a story about two women who find themselves in dire need. I know, I'm going over some stuff that many of you know all about, but there might be one here that doesn't. And I need to hear why this is important. Naomi. Naomi and her husband Elimelech, they decide that things are bad in Bethlehem. There's a famine. It says there's a famine going on. And they think that they might be able to make a better living if they go to Moab. So them and their two sons go to Moab. And it mu they must have been there a while because their sons take wives. And then... Elimelech and their sons both, all three, die. So Naomi is left with her daughters-in-law. And she says, I can't live here. I have nobody to help me. Nobody to take care of me. If we go back to Bethlehem, then my family will at least help us. So they start to leave and Naomi realizes 
that she's taking her two young daughters-in-law with her, and she says, this is wrong. They can go home and find new husbands. So she sends them back. Well, that sort of works, but one of them named Ruth says, no, I'm staying with you. She actually goes further and says, your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. So, let me back up a little bit. There's a story here. Naomi and Elimelech left Bethlehem to go and find or make their way in Moab. It's kind of the same deal as those, I, I'm not, I don't guess that any of you ever did this. I actually did, but probably none of you. It's kind of the same thing as saying, look, I don't need that Christian influence that I get from my family. I don't need that help that I get from my church. I don't need anybody to tell me how to live or tell me what I should do or if I should read my Bible. I don't need that. I'm going over there where they don't read their Bibles, they don't go to church, and they don't do these things. And I won't have their influence. That's kind of the same thing as them leaving Bethlehem to go to Moab. They were leaving their faith. They were walking away from their faith. Now evidently, Naomi must not have left completely because Ruth sees God in Naomi. And she says, no, I will go with you. I see something in you that I want to be part of. That's kind of the church, isn't it? Isn't that what we're supposed to be? Aren't we supposed to be those people that really truly live so that others might want what we have? Sure. So that's what happens. And Ruth stays. If you want to find that story, you can look in the book of Ruth. It's called Ruth. And it talks all about that. Now to make this as short as possible, I want to cut ahead in the story to where Ruth ends up marrying because Ruth marries Boaz. We just talked about where Boaz came from, right? And Boaz and Ruth then have a son that they name Obed. And Obed marries and has a son named Jesse. Jesse's the dad, the father, of King David. King David is another guy that we hear a lot of Bible stories about. David fought Goliath. Right? As a boy, he killed the giant. David played a musical instrument. He could have been in our band. He played a liar. And that liar became the thing that King Saul was constantly reaching for to bring him peace <coughs> as he was under attack, it says, from spiritual forces. King David was a man who had talent, who had love. He was brought to the king's castle where he made really great friends with the king's son, Jonathan. And Jonathan ends up saving David's life from his own father. Then, Jonathan and his father both die, and David is made king. Why is that important? Why is David being king important? Well, the Bible tells us that David was a man after God's own heart. David loved in a way that most people didn't love. David found favor in God because he was a gentle spirit. Even though he was a military man and a king, he, was, he had something special because he served God. All right, so I have to tell you, just in case you haven't heard these stories, I, I am leaving a whole lot out. A whole lot. But I'm figuring that some of you are probably going to want to eat today. And if I go through all of this, we're going to be here a long time. With that said, if you'd like to know more, come and talk to me. 
I would love to take you through the scriptures. I'd love to at least give you the scriptures and tell you where you can find these stories so you can read about them. Maybe we could even start using this as like a Bible study type thing. I'm all for all of that. It's all a great idea. So I do want to say that I highly recommend that you read through these stories if you don't know them. Because every one of these stories that I'm telling you about has something to do with our heritage as followers of Christ. So now, I'm talking about Jesus' heritage. Now we've covered that he's a direct descendant of Abraham. Abraham was the first man to leave his father's land and follow a God he did not know because he had heard him speak. Joseph, another member of the family of Israel. Israel, I already told you once, Israel is also called Jacob in the scriptures. And Joseph was sold by his brothers into slavery and he ended up in Egypt where he became the salvation of his family and ultimately the salvation of the nation. Then Rahab, she's a prostitute who gave refuge to some Israelite spies. And Ruth, a foreign widow, foreign widow. Hear me say that. You know, I'm always telling you, don't judge. She's a foreign lady who has no rights, who comes to a place where she is not accepted, not wanted. She's a foreign widow who would not leave her mother-in-law. This brings us to realize that King David was also a direct descendant of Jesus. Since David was Jesse's son, and Jesse was Ruth's grandson, through her son Obed, David is also in this direct line. Now it gets even better. King David, he gets tired of fighting. He gets tired of all the stuff that he's doing as king. And he decides he's going to hang out at home. So one night while he's at home, he's out walking around on the top of his house, Weird houses, I guess. Gets even weirder than that because he looks down over the house and he sees a lady taking a bath on the top of her house. He's intrigued, so he sends one of his servants to go get the lady and bring her back to his house, to his castle, where he finds out that she is the wife of one of his soldiers. But it doesn't matter. He goes ahead and sleeps with her anyway. Then, again, I'm going to cut a whole lot out of the story. But then, she conceives, and he has her husband killed to cover it up. Oh, my goodness. Oh, man. I, I, I don't know. I mean, think about this. We're talking about David, King David, the most loved leader of all of Israel. In all time. A man after God's own heart. In the lineage of Jesus. The Messiah. Jesus' family. King David. Commits adultery. First has lust. Commits adultery. Commits murder. Lies about it. King David, a man after God's own heart. <laughs> the name of the lady that he saw taking a bath, that he brought into his house, her name was Bathsheba. And if you look back at the scripture for today, you'll see that Bathsheba and David were the parents of Solomon. Solomon's another very famous king in the lineage of Jesus. Because he was the guy that when he was made king, God asked him, what can I do for you? Solomon said, give me wisdom so I can lead your people better. So God gave him wisdom and riches. 
and he became the richest man and the wisest man to ever live, is what we're told in Scripture. <laughs> now I want to finish up today by acknowledging who Joseph is. Remember that was the last part of the verses that I read to you. Joseph. Joseph's the man who raised Jesus. He's the man who with Jesus' mother Mary parented the Messiah. I don't know about you, but that, that's something I've really never been able to wrap my, my mind around. Knowing that you had the Messiah living in your house and you were supposed to be their parent. Probably none of you have ever had trouble with your teenagers. But I had a little bit of trouble with some of my teenagers. And um, I can't imagine trying to discipline Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I mean, we're told that he never sinned. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to get into some more of that in another sermon. But it's just funny to me that, like, Joseph knew. Joseph had decided that he would take Mary and the baby that was in her womb and raise them as his own. He had decided that. And... With Christmas just being a couple weeks ago, you guys have heard this story. Because I've preached it, so I know you've heard it. But he, pre he, he was willing to take Mary as his wife, even after she was found pregnant. And he had not been with her. He acknowledged that God was the father of the child. And he accepted his call to raise Jesus as his own. This is all in the lineage of Jesus, the Messiah. The prequel, if you will, to how we're going to talk about what Jesus' life was like and what he did that we can hold on to between birth and resurrection. Now I've got to give you one more twist. In the lineage that's given by Luke, we see a different way. See, the names in Matthew's list and Luke's list don't line up. And that bothered me. Because again, I don't get into this pulpit without knowing what I'm talking about. I won't come up here and start talking about something that I don't feel like I figured it out. Like God's given it to me. Or like somebody else has been able to show me. So, here's what I found. The majority of the scholars say that Matthew's list shows Jesus' lineage through Joseph. Well, we know that because he includes Joseph in his lineage. Since the normal way of acknowledging our heritage is through our fathers, it makes sense for Matthew to write this word. And not only that, in the culture that there are writing and Matthew is writing to the Jewish people so it makes sense that Matthew would connect all of the dots through the Jewish heritage through the male figure and so he does and he wants to establish that Jesus is a Jewish man but Luke is writing to a group of people who were not Jewish they were called Gentiles and he's establishing that Jesus' lineage is definitely true as him being the Messiah. With a direct line back to King David. Now, in Matthew, we read that through Joseph, his line goes back to King David. In Luke, we also find that the line goes back through King David. But Luke takes us even further back than Abraham because he takes us all the way back to Adam. So Luke has names in his list of ancestors that Matthew doesn't include. And Matthew has names in his list of ancestors that Luke doesn't include. It's believed that Luke's lineage is traced through Mary. Traced back through Mary. 
rather than through Joseph. So this means that both Joseph and Mary could trace their ancestral trees back through King David, through Abraham, and back to Adam. Now, that might sound a little bit weird today, but it's really not, because we're all able to trace our lineage back to Adam. He was the first man. And this is not like these are closely related people. They just have the same lineage when you get back to a certain place. And again, you can read about that in those, in those passages that I've given you already. So, this means, again, that the Messiah, who was to be born of a virgin, was also to be of the lineage of Abraham and David. We can prove it through these two lists of people on both sides of his heritage. It makes a difference because throughout the Old Testament, the Messiah is spoken of as being a descendant of these two people, Abraham and David, throughout the Old Testament. It means that Jesus would not have been the Messiah if that was not the case. Think about the religious rulers of the day. We know this story so well. Anybody who follows Christ, you know the story. The religious rulers, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they, what they do, they, they crucified Jesus. Right? They did everything they could to dishonor him, to make his claims false. If they could prove that his heritage wasn't right, they would know that. And there's no place in the scriptures where we see that they discredit him for that. So we can, we can assume that they would have done this homework and known who his descendants were. Here's the question. What does this mean for us today? The heritage of Jesus. What does that have to do with us today? I want to tell you that this is really what the Christmas story is all about. I'm sharing with you what the Christmas story is really all about. Jesus fulfilled all of the Old Testament requirements to be the Messiah. And I didn't look it up. I've heard lots of different numbers. I know that that number is really big. There's a lot of things that he had to fulfill to really, truly be accepted as the Messiah. And Jesus filled, fulfilled all of them. So Jesus' lineage is important to us today so that we can understand that there's proof of who He is. There's proof of who He is. Jesus' ancestors become our ancestors when we're adopted into His family. When we say, Jesus, come into my life. We are adopted into the family of God. So, we then have the same lineage of Jesus, the Messiah. This is why it's important to us today. Because if we don't know where Jesus came from, from a human point of view, we don't know who we serve. And this is why we can believe He is who He said He was. The true Messiah. The true hope for all the nations. The true Prince of Peace. The true Savior who asks us to come to Him. Will you stand with me? If there's anyone here today who doesn't know Jesus as their personal Savior, let me ask you a question. What are you waiting for? Do you need more proof? God is calling to you. And He's asking you to accept His love. It's love. 
It's His love that sets you free. It's His love that will give you peace. It's His love that will give you life. What better way to start a new year? What better way to start a new year? What better gift can you give your family? These altars are always open. I don't ever close the altar. I think that anytime anybody hears from God, feels God's Spirit calling them, they need to be able to come and kneel and pray. These altars are open. And they're here for you. Will you come? praise you in all things. And I ask